Hi, my name is Lana Swartz, and I would like to welcome, um, well, first, I'm going to welcome you all, and then I'm going to start off uh, with some brief housekeeping messages. First of all, please be aware that our luncheons are webcast live and recorded for posterity on the website, um, so keep that in mind as you participate in what will no doubt be a wonderful Q&A. Um, also, if you'd like to Twitter, you can use the hashtag Berkman, hashtag Berkman. Um, and uh, finally, Mary has requested that we leave conversations to the end. Uh, so take good notes and be prepared to stick your hand up at the end. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce Mary Gray. Um, Mary asked me to keep her introduction short, so she has plenty of time, so I will just read exactly what she asked me to say. Um, <laughs> Mary is a senior researcher at Microsoft and a Berkman Fellow this year. She maintains an appointment as an associate professor at the Media School at Indiana University with adjunct appointments in American Studies, Anthropology, and Gender Studies. Her most recent book, Out in the Country, Youth, Media, and Queer Visibility in Rural America, is awesome. That's my, uh, I added that. Um, and it looks at how lesbian, she didn't, yeah, how lesbian, gay, and bi transgender, and transgender youth, young people, negotiate their identities in rural parts of the United States and the role that digital media play in their political work, local belonging, and connections to the broader imagined communities. Mary's current book project, co authored with computer scientist Siddharth Suri, which you will hear about today, um, examines digital workforces and the future of employment through case studies of present day crowd work on four different crowdsourcing platforms, comparing workers experiences in the United States and India. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Okay, I am so excited to present this material, and I have so much of it that I wanted to share, so I'm going to, and thank you for indulging me in, in holding your questions, but I'm going to share as much as I can. I'm working through uh, an idea of ambient workforce, and I don't know if it works, so I would really love some thoughts on, on what sticks for you and, and what doesn't. Um, and I want to acknowledge one of my co-authors is here, Ming Yin. So uh, she, she may be the person I gesture to for one of the slides, because sometimes I flub exactly what's going on in that slide. So uh, this is work I'm presenting. It's uh, joint work with uh, Sid Suri, who's in the New York City lab of Microsoft Research. And today, I just want to introduce you to thinking about crowdsourcing as work. I mean, we tend to think about it, um, or often we'll have conversations, lots of related conversations about peer-to-peer -peer production and collaboration. In, um, in settings like Wikipedia, and I really want to ground it in the experience of doing um, paid work and what that can mean. And secondly, I want to argue that crowd work is perhaps um, a recognizable iteration of the kind of contingent labor that's been at the core of tech innovation um, for two centuries now. So I want to give it a little bit of history. And then lastly, I want to set up, hopefully get to a setup of a conversation about the cooperative potential of an ambient workforce, and I'll unpack that term later in the talk. But what I'm aiming for here is to say that it's not just a good thing, a nice idea, to be able to um, organize uh, crowd labor, crowd work, a in a cooperative way, as opposed to um, the somewhat atomized um, ways that we think about crowd work now, that it actually could be um, a very important business model to platform economies. So um, let, me, let me see if I can set up a provocation for a discussion that, that might connect to this. I want to say that um, there are plenty of, of historical cases we might turn to. I'm going to turn to a couple. But if you just think about how often we talk about we're almost there with automation, um, that we're always moving the goalpost. So just the common sense um, understanding of how often our our very excited, um, optimistic goals around automation uh, fall short. And every time they fall short, we reset what we'll do to get to the, the next mile post. And in doing that, we create rather than eliminate labor markets. Um, the hitch is that often the jobs that are created are framed as temporary. And often, they're not even visible to us. So in setting up that, at any point, these temporary jobs that are just helping us automate will disappear, we miss the opportunity to be able to see those jobs and the expertise um, and the skills that go in them uh, because we're not really considering them jobs at all. And then the other paradox that I want to throw to you is thinking about the necessity, not just the luxury, but the necessity of relying on a workforce that's always on, um, ever expanding, 
and responding to a, mist, a, a mix of bursty and idle workflows. We might just consider this a 24-7 work shift. Um, but what it would take to be able to, to I, I would argue, to sustain an on-demand um, economy built on crowd work is precisely recognize, recognizing um, not just the presence of an ambient workforce, but the value of it to the very business model. So I'm, I'm trying to poke here a bit at the conversation around the rise of the robots to say that perhaps we should be thinking about innovation as the opportunity for the rise of human computation, um, not just the robots. So uh, let me start with uh, what I find to be a pretty reliable definition of, of crowdsourcing as a job um, by legal scholar Alec uh, Felsner. Uh, he, put, he put this, um, this definition, definition forward in 2011, and this makes a lot of sense, distributing calls to an online um, pool of workers that we often call the crowd. I think it's important here that we often imagine this crowd as autonomous, anonymous, um, and widely distributed, um, answering this open call. Um, I'm going to refer to this work as crowd work throughout the rest of the talk. So if we think about these features of um, uh, a crowd, anonymous individuals, autonomous individuals, um, making themselves available to um, work that comes down the line that's not necessarily seen as core to the, the central production of a, of a good or, or um, a product or service, we might be able to see some of the precursors of crowd work um, in the moments of piecework that dominated textiles production in the, 19th, uh, in the 18th and 19th century, um, and later the shift to outsourcing where the return on investment uh, for particular companies um, meant that there were uh, activities the company was doing that seemed um, peripheral and unnecessary to the core needs of a business um, that shifted away from a model of vertical integration that was critical to building the assembly line that came out of piecework. So as the shift to saying we don't need to own everything and run everything, we'll take some key pieces of our business and move them outside of the firm's boundaries, we really see the rise of um, a, a long and um, actually very um, uh, invisible um, global supply chain. And from there, uh, it's just a hop away from um, the mid-90s and the building up of uh, a reliance, particularly in the tech sector, on what are called permatemps. Um, it's actually a reference. I'm not, hopefully you all can see my fantastic image uh, generator of Clippy uh, letting you know the case that uh, established the uh, existence of the permatemp in tech companies was a case against Microsoft that was settled in 2005. It effectively established the ability of vendor management systems to be able to outsource tech jobs to um, uh, agency, agency employed um, contract workers so that companies no longer had to directly employ full-time workers for critical um, operations. Uh, like coding or other kinds of engineering, it could be turned over to vendor management systems. Um, arguably, these different precursors set up the shift to um, a wider expanse, the possibility of a wider expanse of crowd work to a range of sectors beyond technology. Healthcare, we already see it in education, and there's a really nice uh, list I can show you at the end of the talk of the, the industries that are really ripe for crowdsourcing. But if we take away the magic of crowdsourcing and just call it a shift to contingent labor, I think we get a better sense of what industries are poised for that kind of shift away from full-time employment um, to uh, reliance on, uh, on a contingent workforce for day-to-day -day operations. So if that's the case and we think about crowd work as this next iteration of contingent labor, in innovation around tech sector, then we might look at what exactly the API leaves behind when it manages workflows uh, for a platform. Um, we might say it pretty much strips away the things that are familiar to us when we imagine the, um, the kinds of employment that we associate with, um, dare I say it, good middle class jobs as a way of, of setting up the refrain. Um, and perhaps several of us in the room can relate to these jobs, uh, these forms of employment. Um, but in the wake of stripping out these different facets, the assumption always was that these are just not necessary to getting work done. And what I want to share with you um, with the rest of the talk is the pretty um, uh, 
profound amount of evidence we have that workers put a lot of these features back into their day-to-day -day task uh, crowd work. So the products and services that are probably familiar to many of you in the room um, that are the output of, of crowd work, things like platform-driven services, translation, a lot of content management. So every time something's flagged or we're trying to figure out is that adult or not, um, this is work that primarily goes out to crowd workers, to this contingent workforce that's paid either through temp agencies or is uh, working on a platform. Um, and my question for us is, is this really the future of work? Um, for me, if you go back to that paradox of, um, of the last mile of innovation, it should tell us that this is not necessarily the future, that this future is very far off, that we'll continue to try and automate different, um, different functions and different operations. And as we do, we're going to continue to produce um, labor opportunities that are effectively these contingent jobs that are very hard to see and in some ways are um, expected by the API to remain invisible, that that's part of the magic of what automation sells is this sense that there's no human in the code. So if, if you accept my premise that this paradox of innovation um, means a different future for, uh, uh, for employment and for crowd work, then, um, then perhaps another approach we might take to understand this future would be to talk with workers who are doing this work today. And that's, um, that's where our project um, really started. Uh, Sid and I met uh, almost three years ago now, sat down, and when I asked him, so who are the people who do this work? He looked at me and he said, I've always wondered that. Um, and when we started asking other, other engineers and researchers, so who are the folks who do the, the kinds of um, human computation for natural language processing or other kinds of tasks that they were putting out on platforms, the range of responses were, I don't really know, to I really don't want to know. And nothing gets an anthropologist more curious than that kind of reaction. So um, our basic questions were, who participates in crowd work? Um, what do their lives look like? Um, and importantly, can we use their experiences to teach us about other possible futures of crowd work? Um, reasonably, rather than thinking beyond that moment uh, when we've reached automation, perhaps it might make sense to look at the practices that are going on right now. So we, we have four different cases that just kept growing, um, almost like kudzu. And so the four platforms we ended up focusing on are probably familiar to, to many in the room. Um, the first is uh, Microsoft's own internal platform. I want to underscore pretty much every tech company has a need for an internal crowdsourcing platform for um, uh, operations that they don't necessarily want to put out um, beyond their firm. So Microsoft has this platform, but I can assure you other tech companies that you might be familiar with and have on your phone right now also have these kinds of platforms. Um, this represents a lot of job opportunities, we might say. Um, the UHRS stands for Universal Human Relevant System, another uh, fantastic name, branding opportunity for Microsoft. Uh, the other three platforms are um, Amazon Mechanical Turk, probably the first place we started because it's the most publicly known. Um, Lead Genius, which was called MobileWorks at the time uh, when we started this research as a social entrepreneurial enterprise, uh, B Corp, that um, generates leads for sales forces, so it's a very particular kind of task work. Um, and Amara.org, which is this really fascinating, no fascinating nonprofit that started out as a volunteer base of people who wanted to do translation work, um, mostly through TED. And as they did translation work and captioning work of videos, Amara became known for this really high quality work. And um, different companies started coming to Amara saying, can we just pay you to do some translation and transcription and captioning now? Because we, we really need to get this done. And they found themselves in the middle of balancing the volunteerism that really built their community and these job opportunities that were presented to the folks who work on this platform. So um, to study these different platforms, we both looked at um, the workflows across three of the four platforms and some of the work that we could scrape from um, one of the platforms. I'm going to share some of that data. We're actually still processing a lot of it and trying to figure out how to, um, how to um, balance the need for these companies' confidentiality, but also share some data in the aggregate. 
Uh, but we, are all, we also did um, a lot of field work and interviewing. So I'm giving you this mostly because I'm trying to come to grips with just how much data we have to process. And I would argue for grad students in the room um, that if we're going to look at um, large-scale systems and try and understand the social implications and the social experiences of them, I think we need, need new methodologies that let us integrate this range of data. Uh, it's been a challenge, and I don't know that we've necessarily landed it, but we've got a model for what it might look like to look um, in an ethnographically sensible and sensitive way at large-scale data. Uh, the, one of the first things we did was map the crowd, and this came from um, a hit that we, uh, a task that we placed on Amazon Mechanical Turk, and we asked workers to self-identify, to put a pin in the map where they're located. Um, and uh, interestingly, the reporting from their, their self-reported uh, locations was more accurate than anything we saw in the IP addresses, particularly outside of the United States. So it became a really nice um, reminder that um, asking people for information can sometimes be more accurate than, than um, mining it from metadata. Um, but when we, when we um, map this, we notice, if you'll um, notice some of the gray areas, some of the, the patchiness, it maps onto connectivity. So the, the ability for crowd workers, and this is such an obvious statement, right? The ability for people to access this work deeply depends on their access to the internet. And so if we want to think about this as the future of work, and I think about this in terms of um, the Library Box Project and other efforts to um, uh, offer resources in places that have um, low resource uh, communities, we have to think first and foremost about what it means to not have connectivity uh, in a world that might be dependent on crowd work. Um, the next thing that came out of this initial mapping project, we asked workers how they found out about the task. And it immediately showed us some really interesting, um, some really interesting patterns in how people share information. So what you're looking at, the spikes represent moments at which this information went on to popular crowdsourcing discussion boards. And we can literally see more information being circulated through organically organized information um, discussion boards outside of the platforms than anything that was happening through search, giving us a really strong signal that information sharing and collaboration was happening outside of the platform, that there was really no way to see the amount of collaboration that was happening without looking at what kind of conversations um, and exchanges of information were happening in discussion boards. Um, the next place we looked when we, uh, one of the survey questions we asked people was how they found out about the platform that they came to work on. And you'll notice, or hopefully you'll be able to see from, um, from your seats, that much like the sociology of work literature would suggest, there's a significant, almost a majority of people finding out about the platforms that they, they came to work on through a friend, a coworker, or a family member. So rather than searching the internet, although web searches were an incredibly important source of information, it in no way displaced the kinds of familiar networks where people have always shared information about how to get a job, who to trust. This became really um, poignantly important when I was doing field work in India. And because of the history of uh, business process outsourcing companies, um, scamming uh, people who participated in those, in those companies in the early 90s and late 90s, workers were really hesitant to just try a different platform, to try any platform. So inf information sharing and hearing it from a friend or someone you trusted became the first point of entry for being able to access this work. Uh, this slide showed us, and this is the work that, uh, that uh, Ming led, um, this slide shows us that there is um, actually a lot of collaboration happening within the network. You're looking at um, over 10,000 uh, Amazon Mechanical Workers reports of their connections to other people. We asked them how many people um, would you identify as close friends or colleagues, uh, co-workers. And over half of them have connections, and a good percentage have connections with more than one person. This, and actually Sid and I had many um, laughable moments where I said, I know this from the ethnographic material. 
when I was going out and doing interviews and watching people do their work, it was really clear that they relied on individuals often sitting in their homes with them to figure out how to do a task, to figure out how to evaluate whether a requester was a reliable source of work or not. So not surprisingly, workers um, are not autonomous, anonymous, individualized, atomized um, participants in crowd work. They're also uh, often collaborating in sub-communities and networks that they create themselves. Uh, there's a real interesting distinction between the kinds of collaborative networks that form in India and the ones that form in the United States. So there are patterns to what kinds of collaboration um, happen. And for anybody who's ever run an experiment in this room, I hope this is a little chilling. Uh, because it means you probably don't have the kind of um, unbiased distribution that you thought you did uh, when you ran that experiment. So importantly, for the ethnographic material we have, it's really clear that workers help each other out. Um, this is a quote that I have from um, one of the women that we interviewed in Tamil Nadu in the south in India, uh, and that she's She's directly taught several of her friends in her community how to use this website, how to navigate the signing up um, that's required, which as somebody who's tried to sign up and failed uh, the first two times, it's a little dizzying if you don't have somebody who knows how to walk you through the system. Um, many of the workers we talked with talked about uh, particular workers who posted quite often. Um, in <laughs> India, it was um, a gentleman named Salman Khan. And another uh, in the United States, uh, some of you might recognize the name Spam Girl. Um, folks who run forums become key, um, key in, uh, information gatekeepers and sharers in these communities. But there's also some really particular information sharing that's happening that's also about not just how to do the task, but how to be successful at maintaining this kind of work, um, how to stay awake, uh, how to um, make friends and identify folks who are going to give you the best requesters' names, the best employers' names. So there's a real range of sharing that for many of economists, this looks completely irrational, but I can assure you there's good evidence that it's widespread, mostly because the people who are doing this work um, imagine that the value in sharing this information now is that it will come back um, in dividends uh, when they need help down the road. So the relationships that people are forming hopefully remind us of our day-to-day -day experiences with our coworkers. Um, so importantly, the, most, the, the, the lesson I want to make sure that you take away and you share with all your friends is that we often imagine that crowd work works like the, the um, equation above. Um, but it actually works much more like this, where workers are in their own networks, sharing information, um, learning, and in many ways um, form forming co uh, cohorts that move across time, sometimes uh, three or four or five years on the same platform, acquiring knowledge and sharing that knowledge out. And that this has implications for how we might actually build better crowds, uh, crowdsourcing systems, but also how we might be able to use this as a basis for more cooperative approaches to crowd work. So just to recap some of the preliminary findings that we have, um, and hopefully that come through in some of these slides, workers are collaborating extensively. and. Unfortunately, we have to date not really lifted the hood um, of the API to be able to see how much collaboration is happening and the value that's generated by it. I would argue it's actually necessary, certainly as necessary as the API. And uh, it's, it's tough because we don't have an experiment that would break apart the collaboration that we're not recognizing in the first place. But if we could just value the amount of collaboration that's already in this system and see how to better support it, um, we, we might see some, some opportunities. I would argue that um, there's not just um, a, a kind of um, a, a loose need for this invisible ambient workforce, but rather crowd work depends upon it. Uh, there's a real Pareto distribution, so there's a core group of people um, and I have some really great data and, and could show you the slide, of people who are working about 20 to 25 hours a week on this platform. Some are working more, but as a median, there's a pretty core percentage, 20% of people who make this a full-time gig. They're able to do it because they're coordinating with each other. 
they drive a good 80% of the productivity across all four platforms. Like it's, it's pretty consistent. So we can imagine that this is a feature, not a bug, of crowdsourcing. Um, we certainly see that power law in Wikipedia. We've always been puzzling over how do we get rid of that long tail? And I want to argue there's actually a lot of value in keeping a system that has both full-time and this part-time flux um, in this system. And this comes out of observations that I met folks who literally depended on the ability of forming a full-time opportunity out of crowdsourcing. Um, and I'm using opportunity because that's the language they use. So I want to suspend um, a certain critique here that they somehow don't know um, what's valuable to them and say that for them they're forming um, these opportunities and at the same time they're also really valuing the ability to step away at any moment. Um, I don't know about you but I work pretty hard not to feel like I have anybody telling me which hours in the day I work so you know I can work 17 of them if I want um, and I'd say for many of the, po the people we've interviewed, and certainly for this core that are making up the bulk of the productivity of crowd working sites, they're depending on the capacity to come and go, um, even though for many of them they are often uh, working very consistent hours. So as an example, one of the folks that we followed for two years, um, his name is Zafar, at one point his mother was in an auto accident and he stepped away from his position um, at Lead Genius for three months. Uh, he did not have to do much to be able to step out of the system, and when he came back, there was not much that he had to do to integrate back into Lead Genius because they've actually shaped it in ways that allow for that, that come and go. But for him, being able to do that meant the difference between being able to take care of his, his parent, take care of his mother, um, and, and keep his job, imagining it was something he would be able to have down the road. Uh, that was something he did not have an opportunity to do in any other part of the job sector that he had, had, that he had access to. So arguably these full-time and part-time workers can indeed be the same worker at a different life stage. And how do we build an employment um, system that really allows for the presence of both full-time and part-time workers who are valued equally? What would that look like? so that they don't become different tiers of workers. Um, lastly, for many of these workers, they cared about more than the price point. And I, I'm struck by how many economics papers I've read that are really focused on what's the right price point for a task. For the folks who are doing this work consistently and really producing the most value out of crowdsourcing, that's one of many um, uh, parts of the equation for them in evaluating whether they're going to pick up a gig or not. Uh, when we were, and I don't have a good experiment for testing this, but the number of people we interviewed who said, I'd be willing to work for someone who would acknowledge the work I did and said, thank you. I would absolutely be willing to work for that person, even at a little less money, knowing that the work I did was appreciated and that I understood where it was going next. That's incredibly valuable um, to be able to imagine um, what it is that someone's getting out of that moment of acknowledgement. And we can imagine a system that's asking them to remain silent and somewhat invisible, that that carries a great amount of value. Um, that's something they right now get from each other, but Lee Genius and Amara are two examples of cases that work that acknowledgement into um, the work that's done. And in some ways can it perhaps be a reason that they have such great, um, they have such uh, capacity for keeping their workers. They have less attrition. So as a takeaway and maybe my main claims for, for the presentation today, um, if we think about collaboration among workers as critical as the API, then perhaps we can see it as what's fueling on-demand economies. We really don't have good evidence that that's not the case. Um, until we actually evaluate and place a value on the amount of collaboration even recognize the amount of collaboration happening in these systems, we don't know how vital this collaboration that happens outside of these systems is to the productivity of crowd work or to on-demand uh, economies. So it's both invisible to the platform, and again, in many cases, it's what people are expecting from the experience of hitting an app and making a request and having something like a burrito magically appear at their door. Um, so what are we going to offer in exchange to a worker who's willing uh, to take on the request to remain invisible. 
um, to remain unacknowledged through their work uh, and yet see their work as vital. Um, and how does the presence, the, the current amount of worker collaboration set the stage for a cooperative approach to platform economies? If workers are already organizing and finding ways of sharing information and um, in many ways uh, providing a lot of the support that we often equate with an employment uh, situation, how might we be able to um, ignite that into opportunities for cooperatively organizing platform economies? Um, let me return to um, let me return to my provocation that I that I uh, began with. So if you buy this paradox of tech, uh, tech innovation's last mile to automate, um, that it always produces jobs, that it, yes, eliminates jobs, sure, the horse is out of business, we all know that, um, but that in the wake of every effort to automate, we end up with some jobs that we just imagine are going to go away, and they often take decades to disappear from that innovative process then what would it, make, what would it mean um, to think about these moments as job creators um, and how to think about them as something other than temporary or other than disposable? Let them be ambient. Let them be part of um, the work environment. Um, could we see the requirement that's, that's nested in on-demand economies as this ambient workforce? and see it as a potential benefit. Um, I'm, if you can hear the tentativeness in my voice, is because in many ways when I think about this work, the last thing I really want to come of it is that it just does away with all protections for employment. At the same time, I don't think we've reckoned with how little protection there is for the vast number of people in contingent and temporary jobs now. So could we pay attention to how contingent labor is such a productive force um, in, in a way of organizing employment and refit how we think about employment to focus on those workers as opposed to a core of W-2 or full-time employees who are assumed to be producing the greatest value or to have the most unique expertise. Because in this system, it's, um, it's inevitable that that expertise um, becomes less and less value and someone's presence and their effort and their commitment to a particular task becomes the most important piece of the equation. So hopefully this is about the innovation um, that could uh, bring about human computation as a front and center model for employment um, rather than putting robots front and center. So with that, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kate. I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center. That was a great talk. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the ethnographic methodology that you used for this? And in particular, back to one of your original questions about who are the people who are doing this work, if you could share a couple of stories, um, both from the Indian and U.S. context of, like, who are they and kind of yeah. what drives them to do it? Yeah, thanks for that question. Because I'm still, it's so hard not to present the ethnographic material, and I'm, I'm still working through a lot of the US material. Um, and I, I would say the consistency, so let me introduce you to a few folks that we met. Uh, when I started the field work in India, um, probably the folks I ended up hanging out with the most were um, a pair of uh, sisters or sister, sisters in law, um, part of a, um, of a joint family. Um, they're Muslim. They're um, expected to stay within the home and not work um, in, in formal employment. And both of them had joined uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk um, two years before I met them. They did not know anyone else on the platform uh, on Mechanical Turk. Um, they only worked with each other, uh, although they did have a few, as over the year that I got to know them, they had, they had family members who they introduced me to, an uncle, um, a cousin who also had 
um, accounts. It was much more common for me to meet people whose families had introduced them to different crowdsourcing platforms. And therefore, were, they literally were, were working as a family uni, uh, unit. And Asra and Sabina would, uh, Sabina had less confidence in her um, language skills and the tasks she was doing were classification tasks. Uh, in her in her uh, spoken language skills, but she had she had perfectly strong um, written English <coughs> language skills. Both of them spoke uh, Urdu as their first language, and interestingly, most of uh, Asra's um, support came in the form of Sabrina. You can do this. You know how to do this. So I would watch the two of them work through a task, and most of what was being imparted was encouragement. It wasn't specifically how to do it. It, it was uh, at different points Sabina watching Astra doing that task. In the United States, as a comparison, um, certainly spending a lot of time with uh, Christy Milant, who uh, goes by Spam Girl, who created a forum um, or took over a forum called uh, Turker Nation. That's one of the largest networks for, um, for workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk. She has been um, doing coding and uh, has a you know, really high computer literacy for most of her life. So when she came to Mechanical Turk, it had everything to do with needing a part-time job um, while she was taking care of her kids and had just shifted from a home daycare that wasn't running that well, um, that was just getting a little too busy for her, to wanting to do this part-time work. We met both of them, um, and the strategy we took for the ethnographic work was to, um, and really it was a kind of a flip from what I did for my previous work, we put tasks, we put surveys out on the four platforms. And it was a really long survey, an 80 uh, question survey. Um, so to have 2,700 plus people actually respond to that long of a survey was pretty amazing. But at the end of every survey we asked, would you be willing to do an interview in person um, about the work that you do? And whoever said yes, we contacted them in the way that they requested and met them. And for the people who were willing to stay in touch and allow us to be present while they were working and to meet their families, we, we found a group of people who were willing to do that. So it was a mixture of snowball, classic ethnographic field work, um, but also being able to um, really follow um, the object of crowd work onto the platform, to the people who were on those platforms, and then to be able from there to meet the people who were in their lives who no longer did it, and to be able to talk with workers who had given up, um, and to find out why they had given up or why they had maybe had their accounts suspended. So the demographics are, are interesting in that they're similar. They're, they're in most cases, um, the majority of people across all four platforms have another full-time job. This is a secondary income. But when asked, why are you doing this work, the majority of them said that they're doing it for uh, a second income for money. Um, but the next highest reason it was because they wanted to be able to work on skills that might get them jobs elsewhere. So there was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, strong amount of consistency over some of the demographics of these two groups. Okay, you, you mentioned that, and you were just talking about that you know, these people talk to each other on forums that are independent of the platform. I assume that's true, we're not just Mechanical Turk, but for the other three as well. Yeah. Um, now, is that happening because the platforms don't set up any such forums for themselves, or because people prefer independently run forums to forums that are part of the platforms? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really interesting because when we, when we realized that there was the same, what we uh, call in a paper organic collaboration, that there was this amount of collaboration that was happening off-platform, and that we found it in both Lead Genius and Amara that have structured, engineered forms of collaboration. They have chat uh, rooms set up. They have ways for workers to be able to collaborate. It's pretty clear that there is really a mixture of both where it's possible. In the case of Mechanical Turk and UHRS, there is no structured forum on platform for workers to, to communicate, and I think that's why we see such robust discussion groups that have organized and formed off-platform. I think in many ways the, the recommendations that we have at the end of the paper about collaboration 
um, that I'm happy to share with you all. At the end, it's really to think both how to facilitate organic uh, collaboration rather than assume you can engineer the collaboration that's necessary. So it's really creating ways for workers to use that um, conduit of the platform, both for casual conversation. Uh, it was often um, clear that the, that the forums became break rooms or water coolers where people could vent, um, and also talk about how to um, find other platforms that they could do work on. So it's, it's, it's across all four platforms, and I think for the platforms that structure it, even there, the kinds of conversations, um, they're still really generative. I did want to say one more thing on that. It's really interesting to see how in India, because of the lack of um, a real cultural history of using uh, website, web-based discussion forums, there's almost a complete dependence on person-to-person um, uh, -person or phone conversations, texting, um, or Facebook. And it's because Facebook's ubiquity uh, in India, because it's bundled with smartphones, that it has become the dominant way for workers to either form closed or open Facebook groups. And so the consequences of that in terms of what kind of information can be effectively shared are also, I think, part of the equation. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Thanks. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on the transition of existing industries into global competitive markets through yeah. crowdsourcing. For example, my mother is a translator, and she used to get 25 cents a word. Yeah. And now she gets three cents a word yeah. because she's competing with people in India who will charge much lower rates and do it faster overnight, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that issue. Yeah, I think one of the most important things we have to grapple with, particularly if we could imagine a, a more cooperative approach to this. Um, Amara is a really good model for this. Their translation pays at about, the captioning pays at about $18 an hour, which is fairly high for trans, I mean, that's maintaining a pretty high level. The quality is incredibly high. So they're hitting a market that's interested in the quality of translation. If any of you have ever paid for bad translation, um, you know the value of good translation. Um, so part of it, I think, is grappling with, um, rather than ignoring um, both the labor arbitrage that happens right now, um, but also really embracing that this is a global workforce. What would it look like to be thinking about our labor politics and the political economies of labor markets as a global question as opposed to a nationalized question where we try to figure out how do we shore up, you know, shore up our borders so that U.S. workers get X amount, that's, in, that's impossible. So what we could do is shift to a model, and this is what I'm hoping for, maybe hopefully through the Berkman, is to think about models where we could imagine perhaps through an LLC a corporation umbrella that would allow um, a nonprofit status for workers who could pay uh, pay into, um, basically create dividends that can be shared internationally that would allow workers to form cooperatives, international cooperatives that pay the same rates as opposed to creating um, really um, disparate uh, labor forces and, um, and, and split labor markets. Uh, they're really just taking advantage of circumstance. Thanks. Um, so I think this is really an interesting narrative of optimism around collaboration. And can you maybe speak to the other side? What are workers' fears and anxieties? Yeah. Um, platforms like Turk Opticon and Turk Nation and so many others exist, right, for a reason. Are there yeah. parallels as well for some of the other um, crowd work sites that you're talking about? And yeah. yeah, just generally maybe to complicate this narrative. Yeah, that's a great, no, thank you for asking that. Because I think, and I, um, I, I'm definitely accused of being an optimist more days than not. Uh, and I think, <laughs> and I think one of the most interesting things when I hold up the example of Amara uh, and how much, and I think in many ways because it came out of um, a nonprofit and is still a nonprofit, that its, its motivations were uh, voluntaristic, that it was able to shape a community around those incentives, if you will, so that the, um, the interest was uh, in maintaining a semblance of, of uh, a real uh, democratic participation. Um, that was there from the get-go. So for Amara, what's intriguing to me is as they shift to a, um, a model that is a, a, it is a labor market, it does pay, it has paying jobs, 
is that the, the places where, um, where they really, um, where they strain to be able to uh, make job opportunities equally available, those questions come up. I think they do spend so much energy trying to figure out how to make sure that everybody is getting a fair chance of being able to participate in the labor market as they choose to. Um, and to be able to register that choice is the toughest thing because the further a platform gets from listening um, and actively uh, requesting um, feedback from workers, the farther it's going to be from being able to create that. Um, that equity. But I think one of the biggest challenges here is right now the legal frameworks for um, being able to provide equity for workers is um, there's a, a real barrier because as soon as a platform provides even a modicum of, of um, mentoring or um, uh, training, it can trigger, um, it, can, it can certainly trigger uh, and cross the line into curation of a workforce which means you're effectively responsible for um, employment. And that's not a bad thing, but what would it look like to be able to create more room for platforms to be both um, uh, a setting where people are finding opportunities, but also can find resources without tripping that wire. So there's something, something else other than full employment in the way we think about it now. But the downside, uh, so Lee Genius is a good example, workers are constantly wondering who's getting paid more. So they have a model in which people are paid um, pretty much a, the going rate, what the rate would be for that country. And it creates a great amount of um, tension and a bit of animosity. So there's a renationalizing and interestingly a pan-Indianness to their labor force, which makes no sense if you know South India. But there's, there's this really interesting consolidation that's happening precisely because there's a sense that it's us and it's them. Um, and, and I think those tensions work against the opportunity for a, a globalized workforce. It renationalizes it in ways that I think are, um, are harmful. Um, I don't know if that gets at your questions on Metallica. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Uh, thanks for a wonderful, provocative. Uh, uh, presentation. I, I was looking at the map and thinking how remarkable it would be if people in South India and in Los Angeles are really participating in the same labor market. Yeah. Um, what's the evidence? Are these actually the same markets or are they separable? And part B of the question is when you're looking at collaboration, cooperation amongst workers, yeah. uh, is it geographically rooted or dispersed across different areas? Yeah. It's, they're the same labor market. They are literally competing for the same tasks. In some cases, there's some, and I think this is where those national borders um, um, can be alivened, depending on the platform. But it's pretty clear that workers are willing to cross those borders to be able to, uh, certainly Turk Opticon is a great example for those who don't know. It's a plug-in that allows workers to be able to provide uh, feedback on uh, specifically Amazon Mechanical, uh, Mechanical Turk um, employers, requesters who post jobs. So all workers are contributing information about the reputations of those requesters and sharing information that we could argue they would want to keep for themselves, that they don't necessarily individually benefit by saying, this was a great requester and they paid me well. You would think in economic terms, well, it's against your self-interest to share that great information. We've got clear evidence that no, they're, they're really creating um, uh, a, a consolidated labor market. I think at any moment, it's also analytically easy to split this into a thousand different tasks. But again, you peel off another layer of, of any crowdsourcing platform, and it's clearly giants like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter, any big company that has a lot of content that needs managing of any kind. They're all subcontracting to subcontractors who put their jobs on these platforms. So we could, we could um, be picky and say, well, that's not really Google. That's, that's a supplier to Google. But if I look at who's benefiting from the productivity of those workers, at the end of the day, there's some pretty big companies that benefit from the productivity of this long supply chain. So some of it is perhaps how we've thought about supply chains is really independent and in and of themselves separable from these large companies. I, I think in many ways we just have vertical integration done differently. Um, what was that? Hi. Hey. Um, I was wondering, I know you mentioned a lot of people use this as a supplemental income or they already have a job, but I don't know if some of the people you were able to interview 
were there some people who were like unhappily unemployed or had been displaced from technology and what was their feedback? Would they prefer to be in a real water cooler rather than working remotely? We met the gamut. So and maybe this goes back to some of Kate's questions too. That I mean, we met, uh, there's um, a worker I interviewed who's in Texas. She, for a, quite a long period of time, was a um, uh, did editorial content, a PR firm that was uh, a contract uh, agency for a, a large tech company in that state. And um, her mom needed care. And so she left her full-time W-2 employed position um, with that agency. And actually, it was with a university, too, so extra um, irony. And she, uh, when, I taught, when I asked her, it's like, you know, your, her mom is now doing better. She could go back and find full-time employment. And at this point for her, the break between um, the amount of time and cost of commute uh, and other, other pieces of being at a full-time job um, were less interesting to her than the benefits of being able to stay uh, at home, making a much lower salary. But in terms of, of, of figuring out the cost benefits for her, it feels um, like a better um, just raw dollars cost to st- or benefit to stay home. And we met folks who were incredibly frustrated with being pushed out. And not surprisingly, there was a real spike in the number of people who joined Amazon Mechanical Turk in 2008. In the, recession, in the recession. So folks who were absolutely doing this and went on because they were um, madly trying to find some income that was going to pay the bills. In many cases, this is the difference of two bills in their household getting paid or not getting paid. So there, this is not sunshine and roses. This is definitely people making the best of a circumstance in a broader labor market where contingent labor is quickly becoming the dominant form in which most people find employment. And even if you have full-time employment for 18 months with, a, with an agency, after those 18 months, if you step out of that position and go and find another temp agency to work with, you might be able to fill it with this time. So we really met, we met the gamut of folks who were doing this, and yes, now it's a choice, and we met them in India, and we met them in the United States, and folks who, choice is not the right word. Um, It's out of necessity, and this is um, an opportunity for them to be able to stay above water. Thank you. Hey, Mary, there's a great presentation. And uh, so you've been sort of, I think, teasing towards this. I think it's a good follow-up to the last question. And so I wonder how much you think that the issue might be not so much um, that crowd work is really temporary and has um, lack of protections, but rather that the full-time jobs that exist today sort of lack some of the characteristics of crowd work and the flexibility that would allow people to hold those. And um, what, like, how could real jobs look enough like crowd work to attract the kind of people who are choosing crowd work? Yeah, that's. A, I mean, it's really interesting because I think it's both and. In some ways, our full-time work looks increasingly like this, where we're bringing our own devices, we have the possibility of working from home, but that is such a small percentage of the labor market right now in the United States, and that's in formal economies. You get outside the United States. I really stopped using the word precarious when I got outside the United States, because for India, it's an 85% cash economy. It's mostly informal. So I think in some ways it's can we um, see the ways in which the ways uh, the, the ways in which the work you were just describing that is full time work and many of us um, who have that kind of work might want more opportunities to um, step away from it when we want those kinds of features and at the same time recognizing that the vast majority of jobs are really in a position where they're not getting to make those kinds of choices in the first place like what are the kinds of Uh, What's the social contract that we want to set for full employment? What could it mean beyond time? Like, what would it mean to no longer have a job just anchored in the amount of time you spend at a specific location? Like, that's really the question that's up for grabs here. And I think it's not just a hypothetical. It is how most jobs um, are organized now to be be able to uh, respond to the demands of creating a different product to go in a rapidly different direction. But a lot of this, these are political choices we've made. 
around what kinds of features come with a full-time job. And so it's where I think we're at this moment where we could really ask the question, what do we want full employment to look like? And how do we create a system that does not reproduce the tiered system we've always had, where we have some folks who have that really awesome, awesome full-time job that maybe isn't so awesome after all, and this other tier that maybe it'll get to that. Um, maybe they'll get that kind of job. Like, I, I think in some ways it's, it's, can we bring both those questions together, right? We have time for one, possibly two more questions. So we'll do one and two. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Mary. Um, I'm uh, wondering if you could share a few preliminary observations on the gender dimensions of CrowdWorks. Yeah. And um, I, I feel like I might be going down a feminist utopic kind of vision right now, but just getting the drift from the anecdotes that you've shared. I'm having a sense of uh, women being able to build on existing social networks mm -hmm. in these collaborative environments that actually avoid the gendered inequities that exist in the corporations that create the platforms. Yeah. But I'd love to know what you think. So I see that too in my data. I know I want to see it, so I need some help not seeing it so clearly and to keep the critique. Because I think, um, let me bring the critique to the table. When I look at the case of India, it's so clear, clearly um, the uh, gendered expectations of who works in the home, who does not, um, the expectations around child care and family care that are not just in India but are here. So when I see the demands for flexibility for, um, for women, um, in many cases the, the demands come from all of the other um, demands on their time. So they need flexible work because they have inflexibility in the lack of support to take care of their children and, and elders in their lives. So gender inequity produces this need for I need to be able to get a job whenever I can, right, to fit it in when I'm not taking my kid to school and not um, taking care of my elderly parent. So I feel like there's the, um, the realities of, and women are getting this opportunity, particularly in India, I think the narratives are very clearly there, of an opportunity to participate in the labor market, in the workforce, and to feel a sense of autonomy um, and to feel a sense, and I want to keep to the word of that sense, that relationship of I have the power to make decisions with a particular amount of money and to make decisions about how I use my brain. Like Asar particularly, she was going nuts not being able to use her education. This became an opportunity for her to feel a sense of accomplishment. And we might minimize that and say that's sad. But I actually think it's pretty profound to be able to find a way in circumstances where that's not socially um, condoned to be able to find the space for that. And in the United States, to see cases where women are able to find the hours they need to be able to take care of themselves because they're not spending it in a commute to an office job. Um, to be able to, to make sense of um, and really deal with the conflicting um, empowerment of that. So I do see possibilities. I think the other uh, one, a really lovely anecdote of, of um, and this was for an uh, interview that I did in the US and in India, of young women who said it was so nice not to have to participate in the office politics of having to deal with gender discrimination, but more sexual harassment. So in both cases, I have women in both countries say, it's just really nice not have to, de to deal with like the sleazy boss. That's telling. Um, but if that gives somebody the opportunity to not feel that um, the oppressiveness of that, uh, I would not want to um, minimize that. And at the same time, I think it becomes a call for um, how do we still have the persistent sex, <laughs> sexual harassment in workplaces that makes it feel like a relief that you don't have to go to an office? Like, can we answer both those at the same time? That would be awesome. Do you want more questions? Okay. <laughs> well, let us thank. Uh, oh, yeah. are we? We have room to one of the and stuff. Thanks, Mary. Uh -huh. um, could you talk a little bit about the process of collaborating with a computer scientist and how computer science, other than the nice network, 
visualization that you showed us plays a role in this? Yeah. Sid and I talk quite a bit about um, what made this work. And I joke, uh, and I actually don't think, I, I don't want to minimize this. His partner is a feminist archaeologist. There are like five of them in the world. And I think that gives him great capacity for being able <laughs> to talk with anthropologists and understand the value of qualitative research. So it really, for me, starts with um, collaborators being able to see that their tools are not the only tools in the shed to feel like they may have really great tools for answering parts of the question, but that there are places where somebody else's um, approach will be able to shine a different light, a different angle on the subject material. And I think that that's at the core what made this such a fruitful um, and generative collaboration that we really could see. I cannot and never have imagined being able to picture the distribution of people I could interview like that's just not, I mean, unless you're working in a really small place, you really can't see that as an ethnographer. Um, to be able to see it in a distributed system was really profound for me. Or to be, able to, um, to be able to verify the amount of collaboration I was seeing ethnographically with um, a quantitative measurement that was going to be so satisfying to the folks in the room who need numbers. Um, that, was, that was really helpful. And I think the toughest moments were, were when I could see what he was showing me quantitatively and that it didn't feel like it was enough to see it qualitatively. Um, and I knew it was enough for him, and I think it's enough for me, maybe. Maybe. But um, to be able to see the possibility of both those approaches really resonating, um, I, I, I think we're still working out what it looks like to formalize that. Um, but, but, at, but at the very um, minimum, I think it requires really seeing the value of the approach of the other, of the other parties. And I don't think we're um, built to do that uh, in our programs. It's really tough to get there. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Mary.